hear me okay? Very good. So, uh, thanks for coming to my introduction to Micronaut Talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Graham Roche. Uh, I'm the creator of, a, creator of a couple of relatively well-known frameworks, Grails and uh, Micronaut. Uh, I work at a fantastic company called Object Computing who are really dedicated to open source and I'm an engineer there, leading the team behind Grails and Micronaut. Um, last year I was privileged enough to receive the uh, Oracle Groundbreaker Award for contributions to the Groovy and Grails community from Oracle, uh, the kind folks at Oracle, and it was an honor to be standing next to the creator of Kafka and all these amazing people to receive that award. Um, on the agenda today, we're going to look at uh, the challenges facing Java and, and software in general that you know is been around for a long time. Uh, when adapting to things like microservices and traditional models, we'll look at mic we'll do some Micronaut demos, and we'll have time for questions. So, uh, serverless challenges. Um, serverless is uh, all the rage nowadays. Um, and there are definite challenges to using the Java language um, in a serverless scenario. Um, existing tools uh, and frameworks that are out there that were built you know, a decade ago are not really optimized as well as other technologies. If you look at something like Go, the language Go, or Node, um, they have you know, superior cold start and low memory performance and you have um, you know, relatively well-known folks like Tim Bray from Amazon um, making claims that you know, not recommending Java for serverless. And this is an unfortunate scenario given that you know, how popular Java is and, and, and um, it really is, um, uh, you have to think about things in a completely different way with serverless. So for example, uh, you know that things like connection pools in a serverless uh, model are, are not really necessary because since your processes are coming and, coming and going, you don't really need to bother with local caches because those caches are going to disappear. Um, and you really need to optimize for cold starts. So you should be looking at technology based on your cold start requirements, essentially. Um, microservices, you know, not the same as, as serverless, uh, cold starts are also important. So, but you know, not, not as important. Uh, plenty of people, people build microservices and you know, where cold starts are not the, the, uh, with technologies where the cold starts are not the important factor in your technology decision. But the container is the deployment unit and you know, containers in Java, they do require special memory ma management. And you do have to optimize how uh, Java uses uh, memory in a container-based environment. Um, so if you look at traditional frameworks uh, out there, this will, this will be your Jakarta EEs, your Springs and so forth. Um, like Spring itself is really an amazing piece of te technology. Uh, it does uh, so many things um, that for the developer and provides this massive productivity boost. Um, and it, it does all these things though, however, by doing things at runtime. So, at runtime, it will read uh, you know, the bytecode of, of the beans it finds. It will ana anal analyze them, synthesizing annotations for each annotation on each bean method, uh, constructors, and so forth, to, think, to, to support what's called annotation metadata. Annotation metadata um, is essentially meta information about the annotations on your source files. Um, it's not enough in Java frameworks, traditional Java frameworks, to just read those annotations. Uh, because they may reference classes that are not on the class path. Um, you may want to find out what uh, meta annotations are, if an annotation is annotated, annotated with another annotation. There's all sorts of things that you want to factor in. So, so Spring synthesizes this annotation metadata, and it builds uh, reflective uh, metadata as well uh, for all the beans, constructors, fields, uh, for, for performing what's called dependency injection. And that's how, how traditional frameworks work. And um, you know, uh, all of this consumes a lot of memory. So if you have, a, you know, if you if you're thinking about using something like Spring and Jakarta EE in a server, serverless environment, you have a kind of tough technology decision ahead because uh, you have to choose the appropriate technology for the job. And tr traditional frameworks are not typically the best choice. Um, now, uh, I also want to differentiate here: Spring, the container, 
and Spring, i.e. the dependency injection container, and Spring, the, t the, the library, because there's many, many fabulous libraries for Spring. Many of them are usable without the container. So, um, and the same thing with Jakarta EE, I imagine. Um, the micro-reality is that frameworks based on reflection, and reflection is how pretty much uh, most Java frameworks work today, become fat pretty quickly. And um, there's a reason for this, um, and which I'll get to in a minute. But you know, we love the programming model. We love the productivity that things like Spring give us. Uh, so we live with it. But the question is, you know, why, why can't we be more efficient? Isn't there a way to be more efficient um, in Java? And there's this correlation in a typical Spring application or a traditional or Java RTE application between the amount or the number of lines of code and the startup time and memory consumption. And as your project grows in size, uh, your startup time and memory consumption goes up. Uh, this, this, this is uh, an unbreakable correlation. Um, and we'll get to more of the reasons for it in a minute. But, but generally, what, what, what's ended up happening in the Java framework space is people have been making t technology decisions on adopting technologies you know, based on their memory consumption and startup time characteristics. And in the bottom, of, bottom cor corner, you've got all these like, really high, uh, fast starting, low memory, low memory uh, consumption toolkits, I like to call them, things like Rat Pack, Spark, for, Spark Java, Vertex, and so on. And they, 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 they consume very little memory, but they don't do a lot for you. So you kind of have to hand roll um, your, your, you know, your own DI. You have to you know, configure everything manually. And then in the top right corner, you've got the high productivity frameworks, which you know, people universally love. If you look at, if you look at the adoption of frameworks, you know, Spring is overwhel overwhelmingly dominant. And um, it's dominant. And one of the major reasons it's dominant is because uh, people love the productivity benefits it, 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 it provides you. It provides you with all these auto configurations that are opinionated, that do a lot for you. And, and Grails as well. Grails is still immensely popular because it provides this convention over configuration, auto configuration, everything done for you out of the box. But it's a shame that we have to make this decision where you have to decide, you know, uh, if I'm going to go in that corner, I'm going to use more memory, or if I'm going to go in this corner, I'm going to lose productivity. Um, it's a shame we're in this scenario. And there's various problems uh, for Java, uh, for framework developers uh, for Java, uh, that make it very, very, very difficult to achieve low memory uh, with existing technology uh, stacks. Uh, one of them is the limited annotation API. So Java has annotations. However, uh, as a framework developer, it's very hard to know, uh, you, know you, you, you can kind of get all the annotations, you can get the declared annotations, but you can't, there's no API if you come out to like fuse annotation metadata, or um, say you've got an interface that's implemented, implemented by a class, uh, you can get the annotations on the class, but to get the annotations on the interface, you have to kind of traverse up the hierarchy to get the, because you might want to inherit, inherit annotations from an interface. There's no real way to like, do very complex things in Java frameworks with annotations without doing them at runtime, um, which places an immense burden on the framework developer. Another thing that places an immense burden on the framework developer is type erasure. So type erasure, you know, in Java has generics. Uh, you, have this, you have this field in your class, right? It's a list of string, yeah? You know it's a list of string because you can see it in your source code. You can see it, it's this, it's a list of string. So now when I want to actually get, you know, figure out that this is a list of string at runtime, I have to do all this gymnastics around like uh, reflection and field and get, get parameterized type and get this and get that and get the next thing. The analysis, the amount of code that is in frameworks to do analysis of generic types information is mind-blowing. Um, seriously, it is. And uh, reflection. Reflection is, is slow. It's slow um, because... Um, you know, there's no way it can physically possibly be, be faster than invoking a method directly. Um, and because it's slow, what, what frameworks tend to do is create caches, reflective data caches. Yeah? They, they cache all this reflection data. And we enter, ended up with all these reflection data caches. You know, if you look at a typical project that's built with Spring, 
Hibernate, Jackson, uh, you have a reflect, Hibernate has a reflection, reflection cache. Jackson has another reflection cache. Spring has another reflection cache. There's like a bazillion reflection caches because you know, each framework, there's no standard way to define a reflection cache, so each framework defines its own one. And they just fill up all the memory and it's really hard to optimize for. Um, class path scanning. Class path scanning can be expensive. It's not the main bottleneck in, in any of this, but it's certainly an, expens uh, an expensive activity. Dynamic class loading. Dynamic class loading is slower than static class loading. There's, there's, no, there's no way to really, really get around that. Uh, it's just what it is. And all of, these, all of these problems are a real challenge for framework developers. And you as, I mean, as consumers of a framework maybe don't see this, but it's, it's a real uh, difficulty in dealing with these things at the framework level. So I, I always ask this question, uh, imagine if Kubernetes or Docker, which we all of us run locally, yeah, were written in, with Spring or Jakarta EE. Now both of these systems are a suite of microservices. If you look at the source code, they're built as a collection of microservices. So, and there's maybe like 20, 30, 30 of them, 40 of them. And imagine running 20, 30, 40 Java processes locally. You, you, all, every single one of us would need uh, one of these as a laptop, right? Because the, 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 the memory consumption requirements would be insane. Um, this is why a lot of people go to things like Go, you know, because the, the thing consumes less memory. It takes, fast, starts up far, faster. Now, um, uh, why exactly is reflection a problem? And the good thing about Java today is that uh, the Java the JDK is open JDK. Yeah? You can look at the source code. So take a look at that line in, in, the, in the JDK source code. That is a line in java.lang.class. What that line does is at the first access of reflective data, any reflective data, whether it be a method, a constructor, a field, uh, or even the interfaces on the class, Java will initialize all of the reflective data for that class. Yeah? Everything. Everything in there. And it will, and it will cache it in a cache which is which using a soft reference. Yeah? So the reason reflection is a problem for memory is because reflection is indiscriminate. There's no way to ask a class, actually, for this class, I want only reflective data for these two methods or this field. Or, or these three fields, and I don't care about the rest. It loads everything, caches it using, uh, using, using a, a soft reference. And uh, for those of you who don't know what soft references are, a soft reference basically means that it will not be garbage collected until the Java process is low on memory. Yeah? Uh, so, so basically, as soon as you touch reflective data in, in a Java class, you have got all that, you've paid that memory consumption cost. And there's no way by, there's no way coming back from it, yeah. Um, so reflection is a problem if you want to achieve low memory. Having said all of the, all of this, Java's problems are are greatly exaggerated. Um, there has been you know a campaign against Java since the beginning of time to say that Java is dead because of uh, Ruby on Rails or because of Node or because of uh, uh, now it's Go is the, is the trend. Golang is the, is the new conqueror of Java. But, uh, you know, Java has been dead forever, and it's not dying, it's not dying in, in time soon, unfortunately. It's still the number one language. It will be the number one language next year. It will be the number one language in five years' time. And uh, I'm willing to put uh, good money on that. And it can be fast. Just take a look at, at, at Android and Micronaut. So if you look, you know, Android, on a mobile device, they have the same low memory consumption requirements, speed requirements, as in a microservice environment. Java can be fast. However, many existing tools for Java are based around these principles that I told you about before, which is reflection, uh, runtime proxies, runtime bytecode generation. Generating bytecode at the runtime is horrible for memory consumption because you have to generate classes at runtime which consumes more memory. Uh, byte buddy, there's so many frameworks that use byte buddy, cglib, java assist, whatever. You're consuming memory by generating bytecode at runtime. Um, so if you want to keep memory low, uh, don't generate by runtime bytecode. Java's um, advantages are, are so many, though. It's mature, robust ecosystem. 
There is not another language out there that has the breadth and support in IDEs out there. Whether you choose Visual Studio Code, whether you choose IntelliJ, whether you choose Eclipse, you are going to have a, a, a fantastic experience with a, a great IDE. Uh, code maintenance and refactoring is unrivaled. There's, no, there's not a single language out there that allows you to refactor and, and evolve a, a large code base in the same way as Java does. Developer availability. There are developers for Java uh, available readily and easily in the market because it's immensely popular. Um, build systems. If, if any of you have any, done any no JavaScript world, you come running back to Java with, you know, I, I, ne I, never, I never want to question Maven again, right? I, I never want to question it again. So um, diversity as well. Java is used everywhere, mobile, IoT, server side. And diversity in terms of languages. There's like language choices. You've got like Java, Kotlin, Groovy, Scala. There's like uh, you know, uh, so many different languages out there written on top of Java, and it's, it's a very diverse ecosystem. And there's, somebody mentioned this to me the other day, and I think it's absolutely true. But by the time a language like Go has all the features of Java, Java start at time will <laughs> match Go's. So what's, 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 you know, what, what, what do you want to choose? Move to Go now or just wait till Java catches up with in terms of startup time, which is going to be soon? Um, and like I said, this is an already solved problem. Um, Android, uh, the Android community already solved this problem uh, using what's called ahead of time compilation. There's something called Google Dagger, which is a compile time dependency injector. It's completely reflection free. It's limited in scope to DI because they want to keep it Android compatible. Um, but you know, it, it, it uses ahead of time compilation to avoid reflection and keep memory low and performance fast. So what is ahead of time compilation um, or AOT? So if you listen to the AOT folks, they, they, they use phrases like the pre-computation of application code using closed world static analysis. OK, then. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying just do more stuff at compile time and less stuff, less stuff at runtime, right? Um, and that's where Micronaut comes in. So Micronaut uh, is uh, a microservices and serverless focused framework, hence the name Micronaut, right? Uh, but it's also a complete application framework for any type of application. So whether you're building a Kafka message driven microservice service or a CLI application. Um, it uses uh, uh, ahead of time compilation to do dependency injection, and it takes it further than something like Dagger because it supports AOP aspect oriented programming, configuration management, uh, bean introspection, and everything, everything reflection free as much as possible. Uh, so, what does Micronaut use AOT for? Like I said, it all your DI, all your dependency injection, all your configuration injection, the annotation metadata I talked about. Micronaut will pre-compute at compile time the annotation metadata for all your source files. This means that there's no need to traverse through your class hierarchy and method hierarchy and reflectively do all this work at runtime to figure out your annotation metadata, because Micronaut is going to do it at compilation time. All AOP proxies are computed at compile time. Essentially, everything that is framework infrastructure is done at compilation time to avoid paying the cost, both in terms of memory and in terms of startup time, um, at runtime. So with Micronaut, you can build. You can build microservices. You can build serverless applications. You can build message-driven applications. And this is actually one of the most popular areas that we've seen in Micronaut. We have an immense amount of interest in Micronaut from the Kafka community. Uh, building message-driven microservices that don't have a UI, just listening to uh, Kafka message streams, and, and uh, CLI applications as well. A lot of interest in Micronaut for building CLI applications. We, you can even build Android applications. We have um, Micronaut up and running on Android. You can use the same client that you use on the server uh, on Android and communicate back and forth. Anything that has got a static void main uh, is fair game for Micronaut. So what is Micronaut really? Uh, I like to think it is, is an application framework for the future, for the next 10 years. It's reflection free, runtime proxy free. Uh, uses AOT. Uh, it, pr it provides APIs for doing AOT as well. So one of the coolest projects built on Micronaut out there right now is our, is our Swagger support, 
we, add, uh, we have support for Swagger for defining your APIs. And at, at compilation time, it, it, it analyzes your, your, your source files and produces the Swagger YAML at compile time so that we don't have to analyze your classes at runtime and cost, you know, pay all that cost to runtime to analyze. It com computes all of your Swagger YAML at compilation time. Uh, that's using our AOT APIs. Oh, and by the way, it does let you build microservices. Um, so it does that too. So um, Micronauts has had a huge impact uh, since we announced it in March 2018. Um, we announced it then. We open sourced it on the 28th of May. It sparked industry-wide improvements uh, from companies like Red Hat and Pivotal. With Spring Boot 2.2 starts up a whole bunch faster, and, um, and, and that's great news for the whole industry. And Red Hat came up with something called Quarkus. Uh, curiously, uh, the first commit exactly a month after Microsoft, M Micronaut was open sourced, curious, but um, which uses ahead of time compilation to do dependency free, to do dependency um, reflection free DI and so forth. So Micronaut is changing the face of server side Java by, by, by essentially changing this perception that it's slowed startup, consumes lots of memory, and it's one of those projects after that, that is really changing the perception of how Java is perceived as being heavyweight. Then there's another interesting technology. It's called uh, GraalVM. And um, GraalVM is, uh, is, a, is a polyglot runtime uh, a virtual machine. Uh, it includes a whole bunch of things. Uh, Truffle, a language runtime for doing interop between languages. Um, one of the features it has is called, uh, is it like a native image tool that converts Java using ahead of time compilation into uh, native machine code. And uh, it has a bunch of requirements to, for using it, um, uh, which are you know, things like you have to declare your reflective usage up front. You have to declare up front which classes are going to be like proxied using runtime proxies. And um, because Micronaut doesn't use runtime proxies, doesn't use reflection, doesn't use um, dynamic class loading, uh, it works really well with Micronaut you know, just out of the box, because without any special additional integration or configuration. Now, uh, that's the good news. Uh, the, the bad news regarding Graal VM is that it's still very much experimental. So I wouldn't class the native image uh, tool as production ready yet. Uh, it's certainly good uh, to try out now. And, um, and, uh, but you, it does have some disadvantages. So for example, the compile times are long very long compile times, and um, uh, you, lose, you, you essentially lose write once run anywhere. Yeah? So that's something that you need to factor in. Like you, you have to build the machine image on the machine that it's going to run on. It's not like Java where you can just run it anywhere. Yeah? Uh, so uh, so there's, there's some downsides, but there are some serious upsides. So startup time for Micronaut, for example, is 20 milliseconds, and memory, memory consumption is only 18 megabytes. So suddenly you can, run, you can run all these processes in that are written in Java, you know, 100 of them, and you're only consuming, <laughs> consuming <coughs> a fraction of the memory. So it's an interesting project and one to keep an eye on. So that's enough of the talk and the fluff and whatever else. Let's actually do some demos and have some fun. Uh, hopefully things don't go horribly wrong. Uh, I might need your help in the audience. Uh, if they do go horribly, horribly wrong, then I apologize in advance. This is live demos. Everything you see is live. I'm not recording anything. So um, let's have a go. So first of all, let's get into presentation mode. So I, this is a Micronaut project. And you know, very similar structure to any kind of your typical Java project. You, there's an application class. Um, and it just has a main meth method that has Micronaut run. And I can run this um, as, as just a normal uh, Java application, and you can see that it starts up pretty fast, 850 millisecond startup time, um, started up inst instantaneous startup. Obviously, this is an empty application that's not doing much at this point in time. But you know, the startup time is, is already out of the box, um, a good thing. So, how do you actually build a, a Micronaut application? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a greeting controller, and just do like a little hello world example here. So. Uh, let's see, so let's make that a bit bigger. 
in this to the side. And we're going to say at controller, and this is going to be greet. And let's just do like the typical hello world example of saying get and the name. And we're going to greet the person. And we're going to say return hello name. And that's our simple greeting controller. So how would I write a test for this? Let's, let's have a look. So I'm going to create a greeting controller test. It's going to be a micronaut test. It's going to have tested with JNews, and we're going to test the greet. And um, I'm going to inject into my micronaut test a, a client that is the NRX HTTP client. Uh, there it is. And we're going to map the client to the root, to the root URI. Then I'm going to say client dot, dot retrieve uh, greet Fred. And we're going to say blocking first uh, because it's a reactive client. And we're going to get the result. And we're going to say assert equals uh, set equals hello Fred. That's what we're expecting back, and we're going to get the, and we're going to assert that the, what, what comes back is hello Fred. So my controller is uh, rendering the text hello Fred. The read URI we're sending greet slot Fred, and uh, we're going to assert the response. Now one of the interesting things about Micronaut compared to um, to your traditional framework is it's all compilation time, so that provides some advantages. So <coughs> the one thing you'll notice is that you know you just have to define string name. And another thing you, know, you can notice is if I rename this to, to say, uh, n, for example, and I, and I attempt to, to run my test here, uh, this attempt to run it, you'll see that um, I get a compilation error, and it says, you know, the root declares the URI variable name, name name, but no corresponding method argument is present. So at compilation time, we are compile time checking your framework level code because we're able to integrate with the compiler. And that will catches a lot of things that, you know, in traditional frameworks, you would not, uh, you'd have to wait until runtime to diagnose, which is, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, if I, I'm going to rename that back to name. I'm going to run my test again. This time, it's going to compile. And you can see that the test uh, runs instantaneously. There's no waiting around for your thing, and that, for your server to start up. And this is a full integration test where my, I've got my server starting, I've got my client starting, I'm running the test, it's invoking, it's invoking the server, and uh, it, it's, it's instantaneous. There's no, there's, no, there's no waiting around, it just runs. Uh, so, so many frameworks out there force you to make this choice where you say, um, I, I, I should use a, a mock, MVC frame, mock MVC tool to mock out my, because my, my server's too slow, so I have to mock out my MVC part. Um, because it doesn't start up fast enough. Or you make or projects that make a decision, I'm not going to write functional tests because my, it's too slow to run them. You know, you, you shouldn't be making a decision about whether you may run functional tests or unit tests based on how fast your application starts up. That's, th that shouldn't be a factor. Uh, but it is in Java because we're, we're used to the, the, the separation of functional tests and unit tests um, because th things start up, start up too slowly. So uh, as you can see, my, t my test runs instantaneously in the passes. And uh, you know, if you don't believe me about, uh, about this being a you know, real request and so forth, you, I can come in and say, add a logger here for io.micronaut.http.client. And I can say this is going to be a trace level logging. And um, you can see that now when I, when I run the test, you can see the sending the outgoing requests, receiving the response, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's real, real in interaction between our client and our server. So, uh, but this is obviously like just a simple hello world. What else can we do here? Let's create a greeting uh, object instead. I'm going to annotate it with at introspective. Intros at introspective is an interesting annotation in Micronaut. It lets you do reflection free bean introspection, so you can marshal JSON back and forth without using reflection. Um, and I'm going to give it some text. I'm going to generate a getter and setter. And uh, instead of returning 
uh, string, I'm going to return a greeting. Uh, we, we can say, refactor this into my text. We can create a greeting object. Uh, there it is. We can set the text. We can return the greeting. And now if I run my test again, you'll see that uh, it's going to fail probably. Uh, because instead of getting the, the, you know, the text back, I'm getting the actual JSON, the raw JSON back, so I'm doing JSON interchange. Um, so on the client, on the client side, uh, you know, I, can, I can alter this, this client request here to receive a greeting uh, instead of a, um, a, and get the actual unmarshaled greeting object. But what I'm actually going to do now is demonstrate one of the other really nice features of Micronaut, which is the client, the decorative client. I'm going to create an interface. It's going to be a client. It's going to be mapped to the greet URI, and it's going to return. It's going to return a. It's going to return a greet. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my controller. You can actually share an interface between client and server if you want. I could extract this into another interface and have an operations. I'm going to stick it in there. Um, and now instead of it, so I've got this greeting client. It's just an interface annotated with that client. Takes the name. Get the same type checking if I want over here on the name variable. Instead of injecting this, I'm going to inject the actual client. Uh, there it is. Uh, and I'm going to get the greeting our client uh, dot greet Fred get text. And <coughs> this is um, going to use my client to instead uh, instead invoke the, invoke the endpoint. So I'm I've got a decorative client. Uh, and the cool thing about this is this is all compilation time. Yeah? So Micronaut is, is not implementing this interface for your runtime. At compilation time, it's computing the implementation so that at runtime, it's instantaneous. It doesn't impact startup time. I can create loads of these clients and it's, uh, or memory consumption, and, and they're just classes that, you, that get newed up. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that's pretty cool. And of course, you know, the, all the rage nowadays is to be react reactive. So if instead, you know, I don't, this is obviously blocking. If I instead want to return an R Rx Java single, I can do that, and uh, you know, subscribe to it or whatever. Or you know, in the case of a test called blocking get, to retrieve it. And uh, in, now we're doing a reactive non-blocking interchange between client and server, and it, it's it's more or less the same deal. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of niceties in in, um, in Micronaut. Uh, I'll go through some of them. This, my controller, for example, is not really doing anything interesting. But you know, we have full DI support. So you know, instead, I can create like a a, a uh, greeting uh, new Java class that is a greeting service. Um, I can you know instead put this method in there. I can annotate this as at singleton. Um, I can create a field here that is uh, my, my greeting service. And we can use constructor injection to inject the service. Um, we can then, instead of invoking, having all this you know, potential business logic directly in here, we can uh, delegate the work to my service. And uh, my service is annotated with at singleton to declare it as a singleton bean. And uh, that, you know, that, that essentially does um, allows me to do full DI and you know, uh, inject things into other things and dependency injection and, and all that business. So that's, that's all working really nicely. Um, and and the, the, because we had compile time, we were able to create some really nice errors as well. Uh, so you know, if I added a constructor and I was wanting to you know, inject a UUID in here, now there's no UUID bean. This is some bean that doesn't exist, um, obviously. Uh, so this, you know, this would be this would be an error. Now that's an error we're not able to uh, to catch at compilation time because we're more, you know, dynamic in in, in the long substitution of beans. But you can see that the dependency injection error that you get is really nice, in that uh, you know it tells you over here uh, the path taken. We tried to new up the controller, that didn't work. That, then we tried to new up the greeting service. Then we tried to new up that, and we got to this argument, and oh no. Um, uh, the UID doesn't exist. So that's, that's a really nice uh, error reporting mechanism in Micronaut, uh, which is very cool. Uh, con configura configuration ejection. So I can say, you know, create a greeting configuration and then have a configuration properties that 
match the greeting, and uh, maybe, maybe I'm going to let my, the stem of my message be configurable. Uh, so we're going to have a new getter and setter. So this is my configuration. Uh, we can inject that into my service, my configuration here. Uh, you can use constructor injection, uh, make this private final, for example. Then <coughs> in the stem, uh, so for, we can have like a default stem of hello. <coughs> and, um, you know, then uh, do something like this, greeting configuration dot get stem, and make it customizable by a, by a configuration. So now, so now if I went into my application.yaml file and I, I went uh, greeting uh, stem hola, <coughs> then um, you'll see that my test will fail because uh, I've changed the configuration of my application and the, the, the injection just works. So that's pretty cool. So how are we doing for time? Not much time left. So we're going to cut this short and go uh, back to the presentation. So that, <coughs> that is a brief demo of Micronaut. Uh, you can define controllers, you can define clients, everything is compilation time. Computed, it's fast, it stays fast. Um, <coughs> how small is it? So we also want it to be small in terms of like distribution size. So when you build this into a wall file, this application, that uh, if I come in here and go into uh, terminal and I, I say maven w clean package and package it up <coughs> and package it into a jar file, you'll see that um, the distribution size of my um, jar file is just 12 megabytes. So uh, you can build a whole microservice in just a 12 megabyte jar file. It's really small. Very, you know, third-party dependencies stay small, and you can also, uh, you know, run this with very little memory. So I can say Java jar. Uh, just check that I'm uh, using the right version of Java. There's so many distributions of Java now; uh, it's really getting quite uh, um, silly how many different d different ones there are. Okay, so if I say Java. Uh, XMX, 10 megabytes, jar, target, greeting service. So the, 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 thing, the thing still stops up fast, still starts up instantaneously. I've limited it to 10, to 10 megabytes, the, the memory consumption. And you can see that uh, the actual uh, Java process for, for the Micronaut app, which is this one, uh, is only consuming 75 megabytes of memory. Yeah. And even if I hit it with a request, you'll see that the memory consumption doesn't go up. Um, and uh, the, the memory consumption of a Micronaut app it can be very small, uh, <coughs> which is critical for, in terms of Java. Starter time is generally sub-second for Java or Kotlin. All DI, everything happens in compilation time. So uh, some stats, cold starts run 800 milliseconds. Uh, the Eclipse uh, OpenJ9 JDK has a nice class sharing feature, and if you enable it, uh, you can actually get 300 milliseconds startup time. Uh, if you go Graal native, uh, you get 15 milliseconds startup time and only 50 megabyte of memory consumption. Uh, again, Micronaut is deployable to AWS Lambda, and we support for uh, we have support for API Gateway plus Graal custom runtime. Gives you 150 milliseconds startups, and even for a simple function, uh, startup time is pretty fast on Lambda. Micronaut 1.1 is out now in production, ready. Um, where they have many clients using in production, compile time DI, HTTP client server, uh, 1.1 has gRPC and GraphQL support, RabbitMQ and improvements to the Kafka support. Uh, we just released a release candidate of Micronaut 1.2, which includes our uh, integrated uh, reflection-free uh, bean validation support. And uh, we support GraalVM19 native, but it's still very much experimental. And like I said, it's hit and, uh, third party library support is hit and miss. Uh, we're continue to continuing to support GraalVM native, and we'll continue to evolve Micronaut towards it, but it's still early days for, for native uh, and substrate. It's a healthy project. Uh, two years of development by several OCI engineers. We've had a lot of contributors already. We're uh, already up to 2,400 stars. 
Uh, the project is growing, 6,000 commits. We have some exciting announcements coming in 2019. Uh, so it's going to be a, a pretty exciting year. Um, some, uh, some Micronaut resources. Uh, you know, if you, we have a Gitter community if you want to come chat to us. Uh, online, there's a really comprehensive user guide. And um, the Micronaut guides uh, website as well has had a lot of guides to you know, how to integrate Micronaut with different um, technologies, whether it be JPA, whether it be uh, JWT-based security. We have an FAQ, Micronaut is completely open source, just if that's obviously, uh, obviously one of the first questions that we get asked, and it's Apache licensed. Um, the project is on GitHub, the examples are there. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, and in terms of Graal, I didn't know if I was gonna have much time because actually building a Graal na native image in Graal uh, takes a significant amount of time. So, if I were, if I'm gonna list this, uh, to, and I'm gonna use, Use the finding the Graal one is always a challenge. Uh, there it is. So I'm going to use Graal 19 in Java. Use Java. And the way you build a Graal native image in Micronaut is you package up your Java file, which is what I've just done. Then um, Graal has a native image tool. And what you say is uh, I simply run it without the server. Uh, no server slash cloth path target and uh, greeting service. And you run this. And this will uh, start constructing your, your native image. Now, I'm going to set expectations here. I could be talking for the next five minutes, um, and it might not finish, because you know this is uh, this is going to take a long time, basically. So, um, I you know I, we could spend the next five minutes watching terminal go by. Uh, that could be entertaining, but I, I'm not going to uh, put you through through that necessarily. Um, because we probably should say, um, have time for Q&A. So I, di I did build a backup uh, image. Um, and you know, if you start it up, you can see it starts up in 20 milliseconds really fast. Uh, it uses like, uh, very little memory if we find the, the greeting service uh, somewhere. There it is. So it's, it's using 11 me megabyte of memory, uh, which is pretty impressive. And, um, but yeah, uh, we, you know, Graal VM is exciting technology. We're really excited about it. Um, and we're really excited about uh, the substrate support becoming production ready, probably in 2020, I mentioned. Um, so uh, just, but keep an eye on that technology. So in summary then, uh, and to leave time for, for Q&A, Micronaut and Graal VM are, are leading the ahead of time, compil ahead of time compilation revolution. Um, Server-side Java is adapting to the serverless world uh, by changing, doing things more, more stuff at compilation time, less stuff at runtime, uh, building more efficient applications as possible uh, with the right framework choices and with you know, frameworks evolving. Um, I'm sure you know, we have members of the Spring team here. I'm sure even Spring is evolving to, uh, to do some things at compilation time and more stuff ahead of time and so forth. Um, and uh, AOT sacrifices, you know, uh, Micronaut is not the silver bullet by any means. AOT sacrifices compilation speed to gain runtime speed. So compilation times are slower. In our measurement, around 50%, uh, uh, but it may vary. So you sacrifice compilation speed to gain uh, so much more. And going native uh, in terms of substrate is, is an option for the future with Graal VM, which is an exciting project which you should keep an eye on. So that was my talk, and we have time for Q&A.